Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second session, the second discussion about languages and the pandemic, organised by the Institute of Modern Languages Research as part of the School of Advanced Studies inaugural Open for Discussion series. My name is Joseph Ford. I'm a lecturer in French studies at the IMLR, where we are very much interested in the development of language learning and probing the relationship between language learning and intercultural understanding. And indeed, uh, how this is essential to the disciplinary field of modern languages that we represent. I should add that today's event is at least partially a result of research undertaken as part of the AHRC Open World Research Initiative, and in particular, the cross-language dynamics reshaping community strand. Last week's Open for Discussion uh, event focused on the transnational and what we can learn by looking beyond the UK's borders. This week's event considers the responses and perspectives of multilingual communities living in the UK. Of course, in a crisis such as this, governments, local authorities, public health bodies are essential to any effective uh, public health uh, response. Um, but it's also important to understand the experiences and responses of communities and people living at the sharp end of this crisis. Research shows that the virus both reveals and exacerbates pre-existing inequalities and intensifies the effects of poverty, structural racism and linguistic exclusion in already marginalised communities. In his 2020 report on the dis disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Asian and uh, minority ethnic groups in the UK, the Director of Public Health London, Professor Kevin Fenton, praised the work of voluntary and community sector organisations for their role in communicating culturally sensitive and language appropriate messaging as trusted allies um, and as a bridge to statutory services. So I'm absolutely delighted uh, to introduce our panel uh, this evening, who have all in different ways been working uh, or researching with multilingual communities during the pandemic. Before I introduce our speakers, a quick word about the structure of today's session. Panelists have been asked to talk for five minutes each on their encounters and experiences of languages, multilingual communities and public health during the pandemic. There'll then be time for some follow-up questions. I'll then pass over to my colleague, Dr. Naomi Wells, who's co-chairing the session with me today to moderate the uh, Q&A. Uh, the Q&A function is open and please do ask any questions that you have or leave any comments in the Q&A um, uh, &A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen on Zoom and, and not in the chat box. The chat should be uh, disabled. And uh, Naomi will pick up those questions and put them to panelists in the uh, final part of the discussion today. A closed captions are activated for this session, but if you'd like to turn those off, then you can by clicking at the bottom of your, your screen. So um, I'll introduce our six panelists for today. Uh, first of all, uh, Lee Wei, uh, who is Professor of Applied Linguistics at UCL Institute of Education. He's worked on various aspects of language development and education of bilingual children uh, and ethnic minority communities. He's editor of the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism. He's also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and will be the new director and dean of the UCL Institute of Education from the 1st of July this year. Emma Whitby is chief executive of Healthwatch Islington, where she's worked since 2013. Healthwatch, set up to influence health and care commissioning, strives to hear from communities who are less likely to have their voices heard. They set up the Diverse Communities Health Voices Partnership to help address this, enabling Healthwatch, which is a, a small organization, to work with residents in a range of languages. Yaron Matras is Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at the University of Manchester and Honorary Professor at the Aston Institute for Forensic Linguistics. He holds a British Academy Wolfson Professorial Fellowship, a fellowship to study urban multilingualism and is involved in a number of research projects on multilingual communities, multilingual repertoires in Romani communities, Kurdish dialects, connectivity and language contact and language assessment in asylum procedures. He's one of the leading authorities on the Romani language and on language contact. He's led numerous research projects at the University of Manchester and developed online digital resources for language contact 
endangered languages, Romani, Kurdish and Arabic. In 2009, Yaron founded the Multilingual Manchester Unit, which became an international model for research and public engagement around urban multilingualism. Claudia Lopez Prieto, originally from Bogota, Colombia, is a teacher and activist for the Latin American community in London. She's been working in education uh, for the past 13 years, specializing in teaching English as an additional language. She teaches and works with students and their families who are new to the country or who've been here uh, for a short amount of time and are at the beginner stage of English. Uh, Carolina, uh, Carolina uh, Camelo is a journalist and climate change activist passionate about environmental initiatives and human rights on a global scale. Carolina's work experiences uh, ranges uh, all the way from international organizations and government agencies to the private sector in five different countries, including Colombia, Canada, the United Kingdom, Peru, and Spain. She obtained an MSc in Global Governance and Ethics from University College London and a BA in Journalism and Communications from Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Colombia. Carolina is currently advocating for the rights of the Latin American community in London as an advocacy and campaigns coordinator at the Coalition of Latin Americans in the UK. Uh, Soledad Montañez is a researcher on migrant communities working at the intersections of language creativity and community engagement between the academic, public and third sectors in both England and Scotland. Soledad is currently a visiting fellow at the Institute of Modern Languages Research where she previously led a project on community engagement and the Latin American community in Southwark. This was part of the AHRC uh, funded project that I've already mentioned, Cross Language Dynamics Reshaping Community. Working in partnership with the Southwark Council, her project explored new tools, resources and opportunities for collaboration, participation and engagement with the Latin American, uh, Latin American organisations in Southwark. She's currently working with Community Southwark in the development of a Latin American community network in the borough, as well as on other projects aimed to support the community in London. So that is our panel. Welcome and thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. I'm gonna to hand straight over to uh, Professor Li Wei. Uh, Li Wei. Thank you, Joe, and thank you uh, for the organizers for uh, organizing this wonderful event. And good evening, everyone. As a socio and applied linguist working on multilingualism and education, I'm interested in the impact of the pandemic on the welfare of ethnic minority communities and families, and also on the education of bilingual and multilingual children, especially during school closures. So I'm going to say something about these two uh, topics today. With regard to the impact of COVID-19 on the ethnic minority communities in Britain, there are two issues that I think I was uh, discussing. One is about the access to information, support and resources in languages other than English. I'm sure everyone here uh, today is aware of the importance of equal access to information, support and resources in different languages. And there are certainly lessons uh, to be learned for future uh, emergency and crisis management in terms of how best to convey high quality information in different ethnic uh, community, two different ethnic communities in their home languages. At the beginning of the uh, pandemic, not much information was available in languages other than English, at least not from the UK government or official channels in the UK. Even today, not all information is accessible in all the major community languages in the UK. At the same time, there is a large amount of information on the internet in other languages from other countries. Now, that is of course useful to some extent, but it does raise the question, which source of information should be trusted? There is a great deal of uh, um, international politics around the availability of information in different countries, and I'm certainly not going to go there today. But as Joe mentioned, the Public Health England uh, uh, early reports already touched upon these really important issues that the source of information and the, the consequence of you know, building trust amongst different ethnic communities. But one issue that uh, it raises that I'm particularly interested in is the relationship between language and culture. 
What the pandemic has taught us is that Britain does not only need more multilingual expertise and resources to provide better support to the large number of ethnic minority communities and families that we have around us, but also better cultural knowledge and intercultural communication expertise that can fa facilitate understanding of people from different cultural backgrounds and traditions. We've seen how different communities in the UK perceive the pandem pandemic, how they react to face covering, social distance, uh, distancing policies differently, uh, what they think about vaccination. These are, these are very complex uh, issues that need more nuanced approaches. They get even more complex when there is so much information that is available in other languages from other countries and cultures, but little in the UK. People naturally fall back to their ethnic languages for information and feel that they can trust the information in their own languages. We see that the, uh, the uh, English speaking expats in Asia and uh, elsewhere, uh, other parts of uh, the world rushing back to the US and to, to the UK because they trusted the information available in English in their home countries. Um, so, uh, but what, what I want to emphasize here is that it is not just the language, but it's also the culture that we have to, we're, we're dealing with. And we must recognize that different ethnic minority communities deal with these issues in their own ways. And we must be sensitive to them and find more effective ways to communicate with different ethnic and cultural groups. The pandemic also impacts on the maintenance of home languages of bilingual and multilingual children, especially those of ethnic minority backgrounds and their family dynamics during school closures. Home has traditionally been the space that is reserved for uh, ethnic communi uh, community languages uh, for, for the families. Of course, when the children spend all day, every day at home with their parents, the opportunity of using their ethnic language is increased, which can be seen as a good thing. And some researchers have certainly shown that in their research and argued for it. But inevitably, they also need to use more English in order to support the children's homeschooling. And communication between the school and parents during school closures has been a big issue. And when parents need additional support in languages other than English, in order to support their children's homeschooling, it is rarely there. Not all parents are in a position to provide the homeschooling support in English. In any case, helping the children with their schoolwork in English at home means that what was previously reserved for the home and ethnic languages only is now open also to the use of English in the home domain. And some families feel this could uh, um, have a negative impact on the maintenance of their ethnic languages, whilst not being able to provide adequate support to their uh, children in English either. And it's quite a dilemma that many of the ethnic minority uh, families have to face, which could lead to further social inequalities. Again, we must draw lessons from COVID-19 as we're gradually coming out of this situation so that we can respond to future emergencies and crises more adequately and effectively. And enhancing the UK's multilingual capacity and intercultural communication competence should be a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Li Wei. And thank you for sticking to time. I'm gonna hand over now to Emma Whitby from Healthwatch. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who don't know about Healthwatch, we exist across the country and our role is to gather and articulate um, resident voices around health and social care, particularly around the commissioning and design of health and care services. And as Joe mentioned in the presentation, uh, in the introduction, sorry, we're very small organisations. So back in 2015, we set up a partnership which we called <laughs> Diverse Communities Health Voices. It's maybe a bit long, um, but the aim of that partnership arrangement is to work with a, a range of community organisations so that we're hearing the views of a diverse audience within our work. Um, 
you know, the work I'm just talk. I can talk about the pandemic today, but I just wanted to emphasise that some of the um, some of the learning that applies to the pandemic applies to all public health messaging. So communities are really excluded from all sorts of public health messaging. I think there's a big assumption from public health that we all individually know much more about our health than we actually do. Um, and I think there's a bit of a reliance sometimes on one way communication. So the system tells us something and there's an assumption there that we've understood that, uh, whether English is our first language or not. Next slide, please. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight the partners within that Diverse Communities Health Voice Partnership. So they cover a range of um, communities and languages. Arachne work with Greek um, Greek Cypriot women in particular, but Greek speaking population. Uh, for example, Janity uh, works with North African communities and particularly speak Arabic and Somali with their um, users. So we've got quite a range of people in the, in the mix. And we've also recently started working with Disability Action in Islington because of course, people are excluded for all sorts of different reasons. Um, and particularly with the reliance, um, which has already been touched on, on virtual communication, digital communication during the pandemic, there's a whole other layer of exclusion. Um, and I guess another point I would like to emphasize is there's a lot of goodwill in our little local system, but it's not just about goodwill. So we've also had resourcing from Cripplegate, a local funder, a little bit of extra money from London Borough of Islington. And we've had some fantastic input from University College London's um, health research team. We've worked with them over the years anyway. What they're brilliant at doing is providing us with speakers who can speak in like normal language, but are real research experts. And when we I talk about trust in a moment, I think that's been particularly important because uh, we, you know lots of us don't necessarily trust politicians. And the partnership itself wouldn't have even come into being without support from the clinical commissioning group who are responsible for health and social care. So we had an advantage already that they recognised that certain voices weren't heard in their commissioning and made a little bit of resource available for us. Next slide, please. Um, so the issues with COVID communication, this has been touched on really helpfully by Lee already in the first presentation. It's a complex message. It's an evolving message. Evidence changed during the time. Um, I think we all felt confused on, uh, along the journey. The communication has been very one way. You know, it was either public health messages, which often come across as quite corporate, mainly web based, very reliant on English. And although the Public Health England report highlights that as an issue, I can't see a huge change. There's, there's some vaccination information in different languages, but it's still quite limited. The TV briefings, you know, you had to sit through a lot of talking to find out what on earth was going on. Social media in the country is still really unregulated. And I think um, in the first presentation where Lee talked about relying on sort of mother tongue and home language, yeah, that does mean that people go to sources like social media. And goodness me, what a lot of misinformation you then have to fight. And the press itself is just generally prone to sensationalism. So it's difficult to get at what the real key messages are. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the solutions? Working together definitely helps. And I think in the partnership that we've got, there's a lot of mutual respect. So you're helping the community partners to make sure they've got the answers that their residents are asking them anyway. You're helping the people who are responsible for the services, making sure the population is compliant. And with vaccination, it's also about making sure that people are uptaking it. We were in a great position to really understand residents' concerns. So one of the biggest things that people were worried about was if someone's passed away in your home or had serious COVID in your home, how do you then clean your home thoroughly? And again, thanks to UCL's researchers for a really sort of amazing presentation. It's, we've had the most hits on our website ever about that particular information. So it's interesting what was interest, what was of use to residents wasn't necessarily the messaging coming down from Public Health England or in those TV briefings. And then we've talked about trusted sources of information. So by working with community partners, people trust them and they will listen to them in a different way than they would to even their GP, who they may or may not trust if English isn't their first language and they've recently arrived in the country. They don't always know who they can trust. Um, and you're not just relying on written translation. Um, and there's several elements to that. Like, there's lots of technology available to people. So you can put a voicemail message, for example, 
um, in a WhatsApp group. And for our Bengali speaking residents, that's particularly helpful because they tend to be less literate in their mother tongue. Whereas our Latin American residents in Islington are always keen for as much written information as possible. So you can match your communication to your different audiences. And you also then have someone that people can talk to because I'm sure we all had this, you have questions about the information and a lot of our residents are quite isolated. So by working with partners, you've got that kind of proper two-way communication it's not just one way and then just to emphasize again that in order to make this work you do need resource and that resource is time expertise and of course in some cases you need a little bit of money to make it happen thank you very much thank you so much Emma that's great I'm going to pass now on to our next speaker uh, who is uh, Professor Yaron Matras Thank you very much and thank you for um, having me here on uh, this uh, panel. I, I'd like to uh, continue um, the direction of the, the points uh, presented by, by Li Wei and, and by Emma and, and add a few thoughts to, to that. And uh, what really strikes me uh, the most in the context of, of the COVID crisis is the complete absence of a strategy to disseminate vital information to populations who require it in languages other than English. Um, so far, translation in um, government uh, approaches in, in this country has been used, and I'm talking specifically about translation, not interpreting, which is a completely different um, sector, um, to use particularly to address risks that are considered to be embedded or inherent to the cultural practices of communities. So let me give you examples. In the Manchester area, you find um, that the city council puts up signs in Arabic and Urdu in parks not to feed the pigeons. And then around lakes, it puts up signs in Central, Eastern European and Baltic languages um, on constraints on angling. Um, and, and there's no mixture of the two. So there's some kind of pre, pre, pre assumption that certain populations are prone to misbehavior um, in particular areas. Uh, and it goes beyond that um, to address uh, to, to uh, risks that are considered community particular and to try and protect communities from their own practices um, so the Home Office, for example, has translations uh, of leaflets on forced marriages and, and female genital mutilation into languages such as Somali and Urdu and Persian and Welsh. Uh, that's because there's a statutory duty to translate into Welsh, not because it's considered a particular risk population. Um, and so alongside uh, reaching out and informing and supporting the vulnerable in those communities, there is also, uh, which of course are, are important in, in, in things, uh, but, but, but there's also an aspect of pathologizing the behavior of particular communities that is inherently associated with, because translation is limited to, to those. I'm not against translating about forced marriage, of course, but, but, um, but, but you know, that is singled out. And, and there's, a, there's an element of not cooperation or even information, but of protecting minorities from, from themselves. Now with COVID for the very first time, um, the country was faced with a situation where ensuring that minorities are informed is vital for the protection of the majority as well. Because um, if a minority is infected, they spread the infection. And the government has generally not been responsive. Um, the, the issue was raised um, to my notes for the first time in, in parliament by um, Afzal Khan was a member of parliament for Manchester Gorton, one of the most um, multilingual constituents, uh, constituencies in the country, um, already a year ago at the beginning, in, in March and April last year, and there was no response. And to this day, and, and I just recently checked a couple of weeks ago, Public Health England and the NHS have just uh, nine uh, and 11 languages respectively um, translated, whereas Doctors of the World uh, who pioneered the information uh, a year ago already has more than 60 now um, on their list and disseminate that information in internationally. We're very, very active uh, in Britain. By contrast, and, and this is my main point here, local authorities have been very, very active. They have searched for information from international NGOs like Doctors of the World. They have partners with local NGOs and various initiatives. Their presentations have always often been multimodal to address precisely the kind of issues that, that Emma mentioned, um, preferences in, for, in some communities for um, oral translation rather than written translation. Now, I'm not aware of research yet uh, on the direct impact of the absence of translation. Uh, we've been hearing about, there's a general discussion about the impact of 
COVID and, and so-called BAME um, communities, but that, that's, there are multiple factors involved. It's very difficult to isolate languages there. Um, nonetheless, it, it's obvious that communication here is, is, is vital. And, and so we, we, you know, as lessons for the future, uh, I think we need a, a permanent protocol for the use of languages in emergency situations at the very least. Uh, and there's going to be more emergencies, you know, climate and nuclear war, and I, I don't, you know, we, we don't even want to go there. But but there, there, this is not the last emergency that that the world is the country is going to face. Um, and realistic, I think, at this point in time, and and this inevitably becomes we're, we're talking about issues of policy, so we're we're going to be talking about politics to some extent. I don't think that in the current climate, national government is a reliable partner. Um, with the sounds coming there and, and, the, and the initiatives to even make the hostile environment even, even more extreme. Um, and so partners for these um, kind of issues are local authorities, in my opinion. And what we need is, is more enhanced networking of local authorities to support multilingual cities, national and international. Now, when I say we need, um, where does that put us as, as academics and practitioners? We need partnerships of academics and practitioners um, and academics um, it's not a must, but those academics who have an, a genuine interest in policy and influencing policy, I think, need to move beyond just, you know, who are my connections and, you know, brotherhoods and sisterhoods in the corridors of uh, Whitehall or Westminster even. And, and there is a need for activism here, and we have to legitimize activism, which currently I feel is not completely legitimate. Higher education monetizes impact and social responsibility. Um, and but but there are opportunities. So so I I think the direction of travel um, is to enhance partnerships of academic and academics and practitioners on this to have a vision for society as a multilingual society um, and to create a network of, of local authorities and NGOs because I think that's where we can rely on on a genuine interest in improving um, frontline um, services and approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. That's fantastic. I'm going to pass straight over to, to Claudia. Claudia. Buenas noches. Espero que todos estén bien. Don't worry, that's where my Spanish will, will stop for, for the session. Um, so yes, I am a secondary school teacher. I have been working in the London borough of Lambeth for six years now. The Boroughs, um, you know, Lambeth and Southwark has a huge population of um, Latin Americans. So working with different organizations in the Latin American community throughout my time at the school, it has always been apparent that the language barrier poses challenges in many different aspects, not just healthcare. It, you know, it's, it's very difficult for these families to access things that we as English speakers could just do, you know, with a simple phone call. Now let's go to 2020 and the COVID pandemic. It just brought to attention what we in the community already knew and that one, we're an invisible community and two, the language barrier affects many, many families. In terms of healthcare in the UK, to address these challenges, many larger healthcare institutions offer interpreter services to improve healthcare access. However, it's not always reliable. And now, due to the pandemic, these services were drastically cut or they just came to a complete standstill. This took an immediate effect on the Latin American community here in London and the UK of all ages young and old, all ages were affected. Due to the language barrier, in this case, because of the pandemic, it led to miscommunication or no communication between medical professionals and patients. This had a knock on effect on people um, being, uh, being able to ask for very simple medical help or information relating to um, COVID. Those members of the Latin American community who have to deal with the language barrier daily were now led to source information from countries back home, such as Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, which was incorrect, or they were just left to fend for themselves. Many relied on members from the community to access information. 
which was maybe hearsay, things that they had misread, something that they had, you know, heard from a neighbor. So they were not being supplied with the information that we as English speakers had on a daily basis. This left many members of the community feeling deeply isolated in what was already a very isolating period of time for all of us. Now, just to, as an example, um, I, ha I, I, con contact, I had coronavirus right at the beginning last year, literally on the last day that the schools broke up. I had it quite badly. So I, I really did, I went into hiding. But as soon as members of the community, parents, students, ex-students found out that I had been affected by COVID, I started receiving a huge number of phone calls asking about symptoms, asking for advice, what they should do. I am no medical expert. I'm just someone that had contract, contact, contracted um, COVID that these members of the uh, community felt that they could ask questions because they had nowhere else to go. They had no information in Spanish and what they would read in Spanish was from back home. The Latin American community, like other communities, was completely forgotten, even though many of them are key workers and were still working full time. There is a huge amount of ed evidence that supports the fact that language barriers indirectly impact the quality of health care that patients receive. Language barriers contribute to reducing both patient and medical support. And this not only takes a toll on people's physical health, but also their mental health. Due to all appointments going virtual, how were people who already had um, a mental health condition, how were they able to access these appointments? Mental health was completely, it completely soared during the pandemic and we still see, we're still seeing this to this day. Um, it's hard enough to access mental health support on a regular basis, you know, without a pandemic. Now, the mental health services were completely overwhelmed. For people who have the language barrier, it's hard enough to try and access mental health support, let alone everything going virtual, translators, and having meetings, virtual meetings with people who they did not know and having to express their mental health needs. Children's mental health was severely affected. They went from one day being at school, having all the support from their teachers, from their friends, from their peers, to now having study on, online. As a teacher's point of view and working with young Latin Americans and their families, people in lockdown, people new to, new to the country, having limited English, in many cases living in cramped conditions and living in constant fear of this new virus. This was another way that this was taking a huge toll, not just because of the virus, but because of people's mental health. It was completely out of control. Children who have no technology. So how were they able to access medical appointments, mental health appointments? They, they just couldn't because the, the lack of technology is something that also had a huge impact during, during the pandemic, children out of education. Well, once I was well enough, I was able to meet with Lambeth Council. Um, just having recovered from COVID, it was, it was very, very much in my mind. And it was at the front line of the conversation um, that I had with them. We spoke about figures and how the Latin American community is the fastest growing migrant group in Lambeth. They asked me, you know, what did I think was having a direct impact on my community, on the Latin American community? First, I spoke about the digital divide and migrant children really being excluded from being able to access any digital equipment. Yes, the government um, puts a few strategies into place, but migrant children whose parents are just living on the threshold of being able to afford, you know, rent, food, were completely excluded. Parents who don't understand how they could try and access a laptop from the school. Parents who did, just didn't have, the, it, the barrier was there between the families and the schools. They just didn't have that access that English, par English speaking parents would be able to. The second was Latin Americans in Lambeth. And I asked them, how are you supporting the Latin American community 
in your borough? If we are the fastest growing migrant community, how are you supporting our community? I've seen COVID information in French, in Somali, in Portuguese. But if we are there saying that we are the fastest growing migrant group, where is the information for the Latin Americans? The council took this into consideration and they were very, surpri very surprised, shall we say, when I brought it to their attention. I don't know why, because if you walk around Lambeth, you, you hear a lot of Spanish. And they made me a promise. They took it on board. They held up their hands. They said, sorry, we realise this is a mistake. And they said that within 20, no, 48 hours, I would get translated COVID information into Spanish. I did leave the meeting thinking, leaving thinking just with my fingers crossed 12 hours later I received the first vital COVID information in Spanish they then continued to um, translate information regarding vaccines uh, social distancing they posted this out to families uh, upon my request I also asked them to um, email out this information to all Lambeth schools because Lambeth schools would then know what parents to send this information out to. To this day they are still translating that information which is wonderful but that's just in Lambeth. What about the Latin Americans in Southwark, in Croydon, Latin Americans in, in North London? It's a very, very isolating time for all of us. And then just throw in the language barrier. What do I see now being back at school? Children running to school, but we see more mental health referrals. We see children not wanting to leave home. Students not being comfortable in a classroom with 30 students. Children living in fear that they will have to go into another lockdown. Now, the language barrier pops up again with the whole vaccines, parents asking me about the vaccine procedure or relying on Latin American organizations who are doing all the work. We live in a multicultural country. We live in a very diverse city, which is London. And I feel eternally grateful to my parents for making that, that transition from Colombia to bring me to a city like London. I have been through what these people are going through. My parents have been through what these people are going through and they came here many, many years ago. Migrants who are arriving to this day should not be experiencing the same problems and the same issues of those people who arrived 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, for picking up on those points, especially the, around local authority as well, which I think we'll, we'll come back to. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Carolina uh, Camello. Carolina. Uh, well, thank you uh, for this opportunity. So today I'm going to talk about the CLOUG's COVID-19 coordinated response. Next slide, please. So before diving into the presentation, I would like to provide a little bit of context. So the Coalition of Latin Americans in the UK, CLOUG, is an advocacy coalition founded in 2012, made up of community organizations working together to raise awareness and understanding of the issues facing the Latin American community in the UK and to provide a collective voice for and represent the interest of the community. Our work is divided into three main areas. So first of all, the official recognition of Latin Americans as an ethnic group in the UK and the inclusion of the category Latin American in ethnic monitoring. Secondly, we work to improve Latin Americans' access to health. And thirdly, we provide a specialist advice and information on employment rights, welfare benefits, and employability. So here you can see the logos of the members involved in the COVID-19 coordinated response. And for more information, please visit our webpage, which is www.org.uk. Sorry, www.cloud.org.uk. Next slide, uh, next slide, please. So the estimated population of Latin Americans in the UK is of 250,000, and one in seven are not registered with a GP. So there is also a lack of information in both community languages, Spanish and Portuguese, and the invisibility of Latin Americans in the official ethnic groups and the UK's official statistics, including the latest report by Public Health England. 
Latin Americans have been affected by COVID-19 in a wide range of areas, including income, working conditions, access to healthcare, and immigration. The majority of these issues are the exacerbated outcome of pre-existing social and economic inequalities affecting the BAME communities. A high proportion of Latin Americans do not access public services. Instead, they highly rely on voluntary and private providers with only one in five receiving welfare benefits. CLAUC, with the support of independent members, sent a letter to Professor Kevin Fenton, National Director for Health and Wellbeing Public Health England, by setting key facts, the COVID-19 challenges identified by the coalition and what has to change as there are no national initiatives addressing uh, the needs of our community. Next slide, please. During this time, CLAUG joined um, efforts to work towards mitigating the hardship experienced by Latin Americans, proving our collaborative approach in terms of project delivery through a novel coordinated service provision response. I'm gonna briefly mention some of the project's activities. Develop an informative campaign in Spanish and Portuguese to support Latin Americans in tackling the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis through better access to official information. Provide advice and support on welfare benefits and employment rights at a time in which information is rapidly changing and not easily accessible for migrant communities facing a language barrier. Deliver a series of webinars on issues relevant to our service uses uh, during the crisis. Distribute food vouchers and safety bundles set up an advice headline and provide crisis intervention therapy sessions for the emotional well-being of service users. And here are some of the outcomes of this coordinated response. We reached more than 30,000 Latin Americans through our informative campaign. We provided over 900 advice sessions, received more than 700 calls through our headline advice in Spanish and Portuguese over 1,200 sessions for crisis intervention and 420 therapy sessions on bereavement were registered. Over 200 Latin Americans benefited directly from six free webinars, while 18,000 benefited indirectly. Next, please. So now let's talk about the informative campaign. So migrants' lack of access to reliable information has presented difficulties throughout the pandemic leading many organizations to concentrate valuable resources in the production of translated materials. The emergency response project allowed CLAUG's organizations to coordinate that work, avoid duplicating efforts, and ensure our materials have a wider reach. An informative campaign was developed to inform the community on COVID-19 related issues around health, data sharing, vaccinations, employment rights, and immigration. In the context of the lockdown and remote um, service provision, social media and community press became the main channels of communication with the Latin American community. As a majority of our service users interact on Facebook, we distributed our materials on that platform through paid advertising, diverting the traffic to Cloud's website, where longer sections with information were developed. Each campaign reached between 14,000 and 30,000 Latin Americans in the UK. A good example is our Register with a GP campaign, with flyers and videos being published in Spanish and Portuguese. We walked our audience through the process by using simple questions and answers that were very apt and to the point. Cloud's Coordinator campaign is an example of culturally appropriate and cross-language communications. Next slide, please. To wrap up this brief presentation, I would like to say that the PHE report referred to in the description of the event does neither mention Latin Americans nor recognition. So as long as there is a statistical invisibility and lack of uh, official information about the community, there will be no inclusive and effective public health engagement. So ethnic monitoring is essential to address these structural barriers that impede access to information and services. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Carolina. I'm going to pass straight on to uh, Soledad. Soledad. Thank you very much. 
I am, I am in trouble now because many of the things that I've already said is something, some of the things I was going to, to talk about. So uh, but that's, that's really good. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I am delighted to be here and it's so good to hear that there's so many uh, common uh, issues and things we can talk about tonight. Uh, so in, in the last three years, I have been working on a project on community engagement and the Latin American community in Southwark. Uh, this is south of London and this, is, uh, this has been part of the project a project for cross language dynamics reshaping community and this was a project in partnership with Southern Council and basically the project aimed to support the Latin American community organizations in in Southern in Southern and also achieve a closer and more effective relationship between the Latin American communities and Southern Council. And my action research was based on a series of interlinked programs that sought to explore effective, more effective and creative ways of enabling community engagement. So we could produce and delivered programs, events, workshops, including the Southern Latin American Network, which is a cross-sector network formed by the Latin American community organizations and groups in Southern um, that includes academics such as me, but is facilitated by community Southern, which is the umbrella body of the third sector in, in the borough. So the initial stage of the project finished in October 2020 with the publication of a report for Southern Council. And the report included a series of recommendations which are now being put forward by the Southern Latin American Network. And some of those recommendations are about funding and commissioning opportunities, data collection, as Claudia and Carolina mentioned, because the community remains invisible in terms of the statistics, but also in terms of place making and the creation of a culturally and linguistically informed engagement strategy. That is something we realized we needed to work on. And why we're talking about Southwark, why, why we were doing that work in Southwark. Uh, first of all, uh, Southwark was the first borough to recognize Latin Americans as an ethnic group, and that was back in 2012. And that is because of the work that uh, organizations such as CLAUG, the Coalition of Latin, American, uh, Latin Americans in the UK have been fighting for. Um, it's a very important cultural and commercial hub uh, for the community, but it's also going through a process of uh, regeneration, and the, the, the regeneration process went through uh, the pandemic, so that really had an impact on the community. A large proportion, proportion of the Latin Americans live and work in, in Southwark, and what is interesting in terms of languages is that Southwark is one of the most diverse uh, boroughs in London. There are more than 120 languages spoken in the borough. And interestingly, uh, Spanish is the most widely spoken migrant community language uh, and top five most requested community language for interpreting and translation services. But that is in Lumbes, Lewisham and Southwark which really shows that even if the community is invisible, even if we don't have the statistics, we have that that actually tells a lot about uh, the numbers and the need of the community. So in terms of language, again, as Carolina and Claudia have said, uh, language barriers play a significant role in preventing Latin Americans from accessing key services such as health service and more broadly from engaging in, in civic life. But as it has mentioned, language barriers also intersect with other structural inequalities and institutional barriers, which became, as we know, much more evident under the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. So my findings and experience working with the Latin American community in Southern before and during the pandemic actually reaffirm what has been said tonight and specifically what Claudia and Carolina are, are describing. So I will try to bring a few points into the discussion, something that perhaps we can discuss later. And it's about that, the fact that community languages or minority languages are usually seen as something to be fixed is something as a barrier, no? It's rarely seen as an asset. And in that sense, migrant languages are invisible and totally undervalued. And that is certainly my experience in working with uh, Southern Council. 
So during these pandemic campaigns and engagement activities have been usually designed to make the population to comply with the government's approach and strategy in preventing the spread of the virus. And although this is a clear need under this pandemic, it's a very real need, in the case of translating as a way of making people to comply as a form, as a, as for the purpose of achieving a specific aim, for instance, getting people vaccinated, can better work if there is a long-term strategy, as Garon was talking about, that sees the value of engaging with the community in their community languages in the longer term. So as, as also has been mentioned in terms of building trust, that is so important. So we need to be careful as well how we target communities in terms, again, Garon also mentioned this, in terms of what we translate and for whom, because we can, run the risk of stigmatizing communities further, particularly BME communities, and feed into the narrative that certain migrants or BME communities are problematic, they are not compliant, and they're not well integrated. And on top of that, they also cost the government, the government money. So the problem seems to be in the community in, in that sense, instead of looking into the wider picture and looking at, for instance, a, we have a rather culturally insensitive health healthcare system. So we really need to look into the bigger picture. And the other issue is that the case, in, in, in that case, that communities are seen, usually, uh, Emma mentioned this, as passive receptors of information, that information is one way. And certainly there's no intercultural communication as Lee was talking about. So if information is not co-created, if knowledge and expertise from the community is not, share, is not shared in order to co-produce information, I don't think things are going to work again in the longer term. So my point here, and this is my final point, is that targeting multilingual communities for specific aims might bring little change uh, we need a more comprehensive approach to community languages, which should be at the core of a health and well-being strategy when working with multilingual communities. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Soledad, and, and thank you everyone for, for raising such uh, important points that um, I'll, I'll follow up on now, hopefully with some open questions so that you can also pick up on and comment on what some of the, some of the other participants have said uh, today. Um, I mean, it, it's clear to, to, to all of us, I think, that there's been an awful, I mean, there's been an awful lot of talk here about visibility and in, invisibility, and in particular, invisibility of communities, invisibility of, of language, and the fact that, you know, this country, as has been said, is a multilingual country. We live in a multilingual country, and yet it is uh, uh, invisibilized. I mean, um, and, and clearly, there is a lot of work going on across third sector charity organisations between universities and, and, and community groups. And I suppose my, my question, by means of opening up the, the, the conversation, is, um, and, 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 and tacking on to what Yaron was saying about the need for a permanent protocol for the use of, of languages in emergencies, and, and then what, what Solidar has just been saying about the, the long term strategy that's needed is, is how do we get there? Um, and um, perhaps more specifically, what can we do in the research community, for example? What could we do in the research community to join up further with community groups to uh, offer useful uh, and meaningful help and support to some community, community groups? I mean, how can this be mutually beneficial, um, but in a, in a genuinely uh, you know, engaged way? Is my question, and perhaps I could, um, perhaps I would just go to to Yaron first. Yaron, sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> um, so, what can we do in the research community to forward um, um, work with practitioners and 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 engage in, in in changing these things that we want to change? Is is your question? Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I just needed the delay to reflect a little bit. Well, I, I, I think um, I think we could use more reflection in the higher education sector about what policy engagement actually means. Um, we've all of us who are in in higher education or have been in in higher education in in recent years 
um, experienced the um, need to address impact and in some universities, um, social responsibility, public engagement, uh, there's various labels. Um, and, and some universities have had to, um, because of the demands of the, of the REF assessment and the need to monetize <laughs> uh, impact and show impact, um, uh, institutions have had to offer some kind of support and pathways, uh, research councils, um, we're asking for a while, you know, for impact strategies. Um, so it has become in the past decade or so part of the culture, even less than that, you know, part of the culture of higher education. And so, so it gives us certain opportunities, but at the same time, it constrains us sometimes. I, I find that much of the um, administrative negotiation, the procedural negotiation of impact and policy engagement in higher in in education institutions um, is about um, reputational considerations, monetary considerations, marketing considerations of, of the, uh, you know, which is part of the, the inevitable consequences of this corporatism uh, of higher education that, that has been taking over our, our lives or, or, the, or, you know, those of us who are, who are still in the system um, it, more and more in, in recent years. And, and that puts certain constraints on, on the, the complete freedom that I think we would want to have in terms of articulating opinions and policy engagement. Let me give just some examples. You know, if you have a project um, that is funded by a research council or a private foundation um, and they want to see certain outcomes, are you bound because you're funded by them to do what they're asking you to do? Or can you come up and say, well, actually I've got a better fix for that. I've got a better suggestion. Um, do we sit back as um, experts? And uh, I, I love the distinction that Habermas once inst introduced between the intellectual and the expert. And, and I think some people will have heard that, uh, heard me citing that, but I'll, I'll you know, at the risk of, of um, being a bore. Um, so Habermas says, well, the, you know, the expert is the person who's sitting back and waiting to be called upon um, because a policymaker needs to, um, uh, support their position when, and usually by, by, by having an expert, you know, um, seal, uh, give the, the seal of approval to it. Whereas the intellectual is the person who takes the liberty to speak out whether or not they are called upon. Um, and, uh, um, you know, if, if you think of the, the census that, that we have just had to fill in uh, a month ago, now a group of us were, were lobbying, uh, literally lobbying uh, for a couple of years, the Office for National Statistics um, to change the question, uh, which to remind people was, what is your main language? Uh, and we said, if you ask, first of all, main language is, is, is ambiguous and certain, if you ask people to name just one, we're losing out on data. And if we lose out on data, we're, we're even more ill-equipped uh, to address the kind of issues that we've been discussing over the past hour. Uh, and we have not been successful, um, but the, for, for various reasons. Um, by and large, I mean the question was still the same question. Although we had had, we did have some input into the into the guidance notes, but marginal. Um, but but there was a, a, a debate, um, we, we, you know, which is a healthy debate. But there was nevertheless a debate: uh, Is it our role as as academics to go and knock on the doors of officials or even parliamentarians and say, "Listen, um, you need to do this. You need to change this," or is it our role to sit back and wait for for them to come to us and say, "What do you think about?" you know, is Sicilian a dialect of Italian or an independent language? How should we list it? And then we can give our expertise. So what I'm saying is that, you know, if we want things to change, you know, if, if we're serious about this, these are issues of social justice and, and inequalities, as everybody, I think, have, has addressed in their contributions, you know, then we need a vision, we need to be proactive. That doesn't mean that every single academic has to be an activist. But those of us who do, um, we need to have that legitimacy. We need to have that free space. And my feeling at the moment is that the way higher education is going in this country by and large, and that is not the fault of universities, it's the fault of higher education policy, you know, is, 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 is contradictory to our need to become more and more proactive and, and put in a vision that is not popular uh, against a uh, populist government that is probably also not popular, but is nevertheless controlling things. So we, we need to, to have that, that freedom and, and we need um, to have a more daring uh, approach and a more critical approach. That's, that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Jaron. I mean, perhaps I can, I can open that up. I mean, and, and in particular, inviting perhaps Emma from Healthwatch. I, you talked about your collaboration with UCL um, and, and then coming in and doing talks. I mean, is that something that you think um, should, more of that could provide a kind of useful, meaningful way forward in terms of 
the challenges we face. I mean, it came about by accident in a way, you know, you're just having a fortuitous conversation with someone. But what we knew from talking to residents from a range of communities is that they want to know more about their health. And I think sometimes there's a, again, there's an assumption from the system that we don't look after our health because we, we can't be bothered. It's not that we can't be bothered. We might have lots of other commitments that make it difficult to manage our health, but also we don't necessarily have the knowledge. And again, that can be cultural depending on what education system you've been through. But even if you've been through the British education system, which we can quantify because we sort of know what people learn in that, there's not a huge focus on what a healthy lifestyle means. Um, you know, you get your diagnosis does your GP refer you on to any other information? So um, there's a real appetite in the community for that kind of information. And they really trust it from researchers. It's, it was, wow, like the, the guy that came to talk about cleaning your home, he had like a kind of fan club following. People were really hanging on his every word because he spoke to people in a respectful way. There was no political agenda in terms of what he was saying. He took their questions, um, you know, he treated their questions with the respect they deserved. So yes, there's definitely an appetite for it. Those kind of partnerships would be great. Um, and we've tried for a long time to get them going with our local public health colleagues and there just wasn't the capacity within the local authority public health team. So if universities can help with that, that would be great. And what was the other thing I thought? Because there's like a short term thing, which is filling those gaps around information. Long term, the system itself should be filling that gap. So I think there's a short term and a long term solution. And the long term, I think, is perhaps academics could have better help us to demonstrate how that engagement does work. So Soledad, I loved your point about like, it's not just talking to people now when you need to tell them a message, it's how you engage that community, all of us long-term. And one of the communities that we're really seeing lower uptake of the vaccine in, and I'll talk about the vaccine because we're talking about the pandemic, is the black African community, uh, particularly black Caribbean and African communities in North, North Central London. And that's because they don't trust the system. And, you know, if you don't make appointments accessible to me normally, why should I bother to engage in your vaccine programme? And we've had similar conversations around mental health. A big provider that doesn't make its service accessible to young black men wants to then engage about whether we put a bus stop here or there in relation to the hospital. It's, it's insulting to ask that question when you're not making your service properly accessible. You know, where the bus stop is isn't going to make a big difference if you're actually going to be sectioned there anyway because you won't be coming on public transport so um yeah like how how we frame the conversation universities could maybe academics could help us to do that differently because i noticed we will speak a slightly different language even around this table <laughs> yeah absolutely thanks emma and uh, uh claudia you've got your hand up um yes no i i totally agree with having these links with between communities and universities and, and research, because I think that's, let's take the Latin American community, that's what we need. We need this proof, um, like Soledad mentioned, um, like Carolina mentioned, you know, we are invisible, but actually we can tell you how many people we helped. So we know that the community is there. Um, I also think that it's very important when you're, when, you know, research is being conducted that young people are also taken into consideration because a lot of the time you focus on adults, on, on um, the older generation, and a lot of the time we forget about the young people and they are our future. They are the ones that could possibly make the change. They are the difference. Um, throughout the pandemic, I have um, been uh, helping some research with, uh, well, I haven't been helping, my, let's say my students have been helping, they are part um, with the University of Oxford on the Latin American community and directly how has the pandemic affected these young people? Um, many who, I mean, I've got students who arrived two weeks before the first lockdown. So imagine being in school for two weeks then going home to study online, not knowing a word of English, you know, living in cramped conditions. So yes, I think research is vital. Um, I also think it's, you know, it's important to take everyone's needs into consideration and remember all the members of the community, all the different ages, you know, primary school children are facing something completely different to what 
teenagers are facing and then you've got uh, students in in college um those who are struggling with their you know coming to terms that they're not going to sit um gcses and you you would think most children would scream and shout yes we're not doing gcses or a levels but the sheer panic of when they heard that a levels were um a levels and gcses were cancelled last year and this year um, was just awful to see. Um, those students who have tried and worked so hard to learn a new language, to be able to show themselves, their families, um, that they are able to, to speak two languages. I mean, being bilingual, being trilingual, it's such a blessing. It's such a beautiful thing that we need to celebrate. And I think being recognised as communities you know being able to go and say i can read this in spanish i can read this in english it's it's just going to it's such a positive thing for any community um with any language and you know being surrounded by by you all who who are we're all on the on the same same wavelength it's just incredible um so yes i think research is definitely important that's my point <laughs> thank you Thanks, Claudia. Uh, Carolina. Yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more with Claudia and Soledad, uh, definitely. But look, so despite our relevant contribution to the functioning of, of London and also the UK in general, right, so economically, socially, and culturally, um, very little is known about the Latin American community. So when I was saying we have an estimate of our population around 250,000, it was because of our research. And there is a cornerstone, um, that report is called the No Longer Invisible actually. And it was written all the way back in 2011. So you see, we highly rely um, as community organizations when we do advocacy and campaigns on research. So this is definitely very important for us. And because we're invisible, because the government doesn't recognize us as one of these any uh, minority groups, so we really need to collect the data somehow. And definitely research is, is um, plays an important and pivotal role here. So I think that's my research is, is much needed um, right now. And also because of the lack of knowledge. Um, so the result, is, the result is also this lack of formal ways to collect information as I mentioned before. So we don't know the impact exactly on uh, the COVID-19 on the Latin American communities. We have some information and we gather this information through our advice sessions and our case workers, right? And because we have this database with our um, service users. But other than that, we don't have this official recognition. And, and so we don't have this official statistical information. So I think that if um, research can support us by, I don't know, gathering people or um, preparing surveys, for example, um, in those highly concentrated populations areas like Southern, Lambic and so on, and also working with the organizations. Um, so I think we can increase the knowledge, we can start collecting data and definitely we can start making visible our community. So I think that's, that's the main point because Sometimes probably information is being recorded, but maybe not in, in the proper way. So maybe there is a lot of, um, you know, we are collecting information that is not convenient. Why? Because most of our service users, well, like some of them, they have this dual citizenship. So they are um, EU nationals or maybe they have British passports. So the question is not what is your nationality, right? So the question is about the ethnicity. That is key. Because of that, recognition is extremely important for us. And if we can support this recognition and make our um, community visible uh, by research, right? So that we can show to the government and decision makers, look, so this is information that we've been collecting because well, we need to fill that gap. So I think that's, that's very important. Thank you. Thanks, Rolia. I'm gonna pass over to Lee Wei on that question before then I'll pass over to my colleague Naomi because I know we do have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, Lee Wei. Sure, yeah, just a, a, a quick response on the important points that Carolina, uh, Carolina uh, made uh, and also by others. Uh, sometimes the labeling um, that doesn't help because, uh, you know, when we talk about Latin American community or the Asian community, it, it just conceals the important internal diversities from within these communities. Uh, you know, there are different groups within these big groups 
and also uh, different generations, from, you know, people will have very different attitudes. So we, we need to make sure that the internal diversities uh, are somehow considered as an important issue in, in, make, in making policy decisions. And also going back to what um, Emma and uh, Yaran said, uh, you know, academics love working with professionals who have direct connections with these communities and love working with communities directly as well. You know, we, we have difficulties working with po uh, politicians, let's face it, but ultimately we want to impact on policy and practice. And it is the professionals, it is the communities that we really love of working with directly. And I'm sure, you know, uh, we would all want to uh, find new opportunities of working together. Thank you very much, Liwei. Uh, Naomi. Thanks, yeah, I'll just kind of, hopefully I've been moving things over into answer just so that everyone in the audience can see some of the comments and questions that we've been receiving. Um, there's a lot of shared frustration, I think about working particularly with government and getting these messages a lot of you know this has been happening for a long time um i don't know if anyone else i think someone said there used to be borough language coordinators in the 1980s and 1990s which i certainly didn't know about and the fact that those roles it seems disappeared um but just to kind of move to a question i'll there's an interesting question and this is about language and um, i might start with soledad to bring you into the conversation because it connects with your research and someone's asked should language be made a protected characteristic to ensure visibility, provision and equality? So I think the kind of recognition of language and I just, I don't know Soledad if you wanted to start with any thoughts on that kind of idea. Yeah, and that is actually very interesting. It's one of the things I mentioned in the reports that when we're working with multilingual communities, migrant communities that speak different languages other than English, we cannot talk about protected characteristics without considering language, especially considering that we know that intersects with so many other barriers. So certainly I do agree and we have to make a point about that. And it is interesting because when we talk about BME and we know that that term is now being contested and so on, but when we talk about BME communities, we tend to erase multilingualism. So we focus on ethnicity and race. Uh, so I think that is something that we, we need to consider. And it's certainly what I experienced by working with the Latin American community in, in Southwark. Is there any, that's great. Yeah, I think we can all, we've heard here a lot about the importance of language and it's really come through in everyone's work and research. Does anyone else have any views on this idea? I think Emma, did you want to? I mean, there's other, there's lots of other things I'd put in the protected characteristics list. We noticed when we were trying to sort of ascertain what level of interpreting you would expect in different GP practices around our borough, that just nobody had any idea of, you know, what's good. Is this practice offering enough? Are they not offering so many because they've got some languages spoken? What are the languages needed? And, and it comes back to this question of, it's not just about what languages you speak, but is your, do you have enough English to carry out a consultation with your GP? You know, and, and you can't ask such a specific question in the, in the census necessarily, but there needs to be some sort of understanding. And I think, you know, my experiences in health and social care commissioning, we don't always go into that much detail. There's a slight overlap with the deaf community because British Sign Language, because they're kind of covered under disability, so we try and kind of bring the two things together in the conversations we're having locally. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So just some thoughts from, from Health Watch. Okay, I think, um, Yaron, did you have your hand raised next, I think? And then, then we'll go to Carolina. This, thank you, this is actually the first time I figured out how to use that hand. Um, so, uh, yeah, certainly I'm in favor of protecting language, but we, we, we should, we have to take a non-essentializing approach to language. Um, language is, is a repertoire, a living and dynamic repertoire of resources. Uh, and people have different kinds of knowledges of different varieties of languages, which they choose use for, for different purposes. And I think that's the, the, the importance of, of having a, a, a pluralistic approach to, to language. Um, is precisely as, as, as Emma said, I mean, somebody might have a language but might still be able to 
um, communicate with their GP or communicate about certain things and not about others. It, it's a continuum. It evolves during our lifetime and it is dynamic at, at any given point in, in our lifetime. And I think that's very, very important. And, and that's important to communicate both from the research and the practice oriented side because we tend to have in, in, in this society, again, a very essentializing, you know, this is your language by birth. And I, even this concept, uh, mother tongue, which, which is often, um, you know, used kind of progressively as to protect your mother tongue. I'm anyway in favor of substituting that with mother and father tongue because I'm a, you know, proud father who passed on his language to his child. Um, and it's otherwise discriminatory in, 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 in many ways, different ways. Uh, but, but either way, I mean, th that, that is this kind of, a, you know, as if we're born with a language and that's our language for life. And that, that is not the case necessarily. So we need that uh, within the narrative, an argument for protection of languages. We need um, to explain the, um, that we, we need to take a differentiated and pluralistic approach to um, language varieties and language repertoires. Um, yeah, so for example, the government has a list of these ethnic um, um, languages, right? And I believe they are like 12 or 18 in total. So the recognized languages, because they already recognize the minorities. So Spanish and Portuguese, um, they are not part of that list. Therefore, um, relevant information on health services, for example, or any other official information is not translated into Spanish and Portuguese. Um, on the other thing, uh, for example, uh, the Brazilian government uh, during the COVID-19 um, COVID crisis was actually encouraging Brazilians, uh, Brazilians to mix together. So that was fine from the Brazilian government. But the narrative in here was completely different. So our community got, because of the cultural context, two different and conflicting information. So I think that if we have, you know, this proper translation um, into, you know, the languages of our uh, minorities, so they will be properly informed and therefore they can be, you know, like better, um, um, they can just um, have, you know, all the information they need to be well informed and to take the best decisions uh, for their lives. So I think this is very important just to uh, mitigate this barrier. And this is a job that we have to do on an ongoing basis. But um, this, is, this is why recognition is very important because once we are recognized, not at this local level, right, at some boroughs, but at this national level, so our language will be included um, in the government, um, any languages. Thank you. Great, I think um, just to kind of move on to a few other questions, I might, um, there's an interesting question still on the language about the use of idiomatic language and modes of public health messages in English even that are maybe a barrier themselves to effective health communication. And I know Li Wei mentioned very much intercultural communication. So I wondered Li Wei if you had any thoughts on this idiomatic, we might be thinking here about Boris Johnson's press conferences, I'm possibly suspecting this might be connected to. So if you had any thought on that in relation to effective communication. Yes, well, I mean, it is a really important issue, actually. I, I, I'm no, I have no expertise on this particular uh, topic, but I, uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, Sophie Dumin and others uh, in our centre, uh, work on uh, metaphor, the use of metaphors in uh, clinical communication or health-related communication. It's always uh, a very uh, um, uh, complex issue, even for the so-called monolinguals, if you like. And I think cross-culturally and cross-linguistically, it's a, it's a very challenging uh, issue. Uh, in the meantime, we also have communities that uh, have very different, tradi different traditions of communication. Uh, uh, it's not always through the kind of, you know, uh, standard language that we, uh, as we know it. And certainly the print literature is not always useful. Uh, as we've seen in many different parts of the world as well, especially in health communication, actually. Uh, very often you have to communicate entirely through the oral uh, uh, domain. Um, I, I think, I mean, you know, basically it's, it's a, a big issue that we all have to uh, um, find ways to, uh, to address. Certainly it's a, it's a big responsibility for uh, linguists. 
Great. And I can see Claudia wanted to come in and, and this we might be able to connect this to another question, which someone asked about the translations you actually received, Claudia, and if they were any good because they were done so quickly. <laughs> so it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that as well. Um, right. So my hand shot up as soon as you said idiomatic language. Why? Because I teach English as a second language. And what do I say? One of the first things, you know, in trainings with teachers, stay away from idioms. Please just stay away from idioms with, with the students because, you know, it's hard enough to be learning a language. And then you're throwing if uh, pigs could fly. To, as as um, actually a, a staff member told one of my uh, students to take it on the chin the other day. So immediately he touched his chin. So that's what he, and I said, no, 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 no. And then I explained it to him. And I think the, go, it, the same goes for, for anything, you know, the press conferences, the information that was um, sent out, even for, for, for English speakers, for mon monolingual uh, speakers, it's very wordy. I mean, all you need to know is one, two, three, four, five. You don't need to, you know, throwing all this vocabulary, all this language, because there are there are people that find reading hard, you know, the visually impaired. Um, we just need people to know what they need to do and what they need to do to keep safe. And I think it goes, you know, with um, the healthcare system, with education. When I translate letters to parents, my letters are always half of what the English speaking parents will get because I just need to get straight to the point um, and, and use vocabulary that we know everyone will understand, not just academics, not just people who, who have had an ed education. We need to be able to inform everyone, whether they speak English, whether they speak Spanish, whether they, they speak Somali, everyone has the right to this information. So I just think we need to just get it out there. The points are clear stay away from idioms because that's not going to, to help anyway anyone um just as if I, I i mean if i was speaking in spanish to to someone who you know who's as passionate about spanish i wouldn't throw throw in sayings that we we say in colombia because i mean you know they're, they're just not going to understand um and coming back to the translations so yes they were they were good translations i was actually very very surprised when I got the email through in in 12 hours I did leave thinking oh I'm not too sure if that's going to happen because it you know it's not like I many many people had tried to get translations in Lambeth um, I don't know if I was just lucky on the day um, due to the pandemic maybe it's my uh, I don't know Colombian charm shall we say I got straight there straight to the point um, but yes, the translations, uh, I've got the first copy 12 uh, hours later, then 24 hours later, the actual Lambeth newsletter was also translated, which is continually to, uh, translated. Schools, we get, I think we get information now, um, at least once a month, the last information that we received was on how to register for a GP, um, that refugees and migrants, uh, if you're homeless, you can also, um, you also have access to the vaccine. So a lot of information has, has gone out. And I mean, if they were able to do that in 48 hours, surely other councils um, can do the same. I don't know how they did it. I know they've got a department because they do trans translate a lot. Um, Spanish, just like English, Spanish from Spain, from Colombia, from Ecuador, from Bolivia. We all have our our our, our different uh, wording. Our you know, so it's a Spanish that everyone could understand, um, and it, and it was vital for the community. I'm I'm always forever sending out the information um, that they send, and I think it's very very useful. And I'm glad they took my point on board to send it out to to schools because schools in in those boroughs we know our families we know who needs this information in in french in somali in portuguese in spanish um so yes yeah, so it was good translations and yes very pleased very surprised very happy great and emma I was just going to speak in support of idioms. I love an idiom. As a former student of language and literature, I'm really into, into that in poetry and in literature. 
but I don't think it, I wouldn't, you know, we don't bring it into work. So in work, you need clear messaging, don't you, with the kind of work that we're talking about. And this is another place where I think there's a bit of an overlap with disability, actually. And I'm not suggesting that language need and disability are the same, but sometimes you can use that legislation to help you. And for, uh, for autistic residents, literal, uh, that, who can understand things more literally, idioms are extremely unhelpful. And so, you know, we should be advocating for plain English anyway, in a work setting. Let's be poetic if we want to in our free time. But yeah, it needs to be clear so that people understand. Brilliant. I think we might have to, there's been some other interesting comments. So just mentioned people are also talking about the diasporic media. So it is important to recognise that communities are, are, you know, as I think Catalina emphasised, communities organise themselves to share information. And, you know, there is misinformation, but there's also some very good information that's being shared through kind of diasporic media. So I think it's important that we kind of acknowledge that important work. Um, I'll hand over to Joe to, if he wants to kind of wrap up, um, very much Naomi and, and thanks everyone for such uh, interesting questions and brilliant brilliant responses. I know um, I just wanted to uh, before thank you our speakers and before bringing, bringing the session to an end I just wanted to announce that um, the next event in the Open for Discussion series is uh, coming up in the next few weeks and I think Naomi you've got the link to post in the chat so people can click on that link and, and register that next event. Um, uh, the event is uh, on how can history strengthen democracy? So that might be interesting uh, to people attending uh, today. Um, just to draw things to a close really, um, and to really just, just thank our speakers for joining us today and for raising you know, um, such vital questions that as, we, as we've been saying kind of continually are often uh, rendered invisible um, in uh, discussions uh, around the pandemic, but of course it, 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 it goes way beyond the pandemic and uh, precedes the pandemic as well. So I think that's incredibly important to, to raise those points. So thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Naomi for uh, taking questions and for co-chairing, co-organizing with me. And thank you very much for uh, the co-organization behind the scenes from uh, Cathy Collins and Gemma uh, in uh, the Institute of Modern Languages Research and the School of Advanced Study. Um, so, um, and final thanks to the audience for coming tonight and for your brilliant questions. Um, so I'm gonna close things there. Um, thank you everyone. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon at the next session. Bye now. <laughs>